In this lecture, we're going to talk about the joints uh, and their shape and their function. So joints can be designed for stability, that is with deep grooves or strong ligaments uh, that make them stable like uh, the ulnar humeral joint, uh, part of the elbow joint, which is meant to just move like a hinge in one degree of rotational freedom, or uh, to be very mobile, uh, like the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder, which we're looking from above in an anatomical preparation. Uh, the glenohumeral joint is the most mobile joint in the whole body, and perhaps, unsurprisingly, also the most easily and frequently dislocated. So joints can be categorized based upon their mobility, based upon the connective tissue, uh, which are involved in the utilities of that connective tissue uh, and because of the joint surface. So now we're going to do that. Three major categories of joints, the synarthroses, the amphiarthroses, and the fully diarthroidal joints, or joints that are meant to move freely. Uh, this is a very handsome guy in the picture, by the way, don't you think? The most Generally, the most stable of the joints are the first type, the synarthroses, which include the sutures and the syndesmoses. Sutures are joints where bone meets bone, uh, and they occur because of maturation, such as in the skull or, or in the pelvis. Uh, when we're very young, there's wide areas of hyaline cartilage, uh, that are making up part of the structural parts of those bones, but as we mature, the hyaline cartilage shrinks, uh, the bone grows across, and they join together as sutures. Synthesmoses are fibrous joints. Um, an example in, are the interosseous membranes uh, between the bones of the lower leg, the fibula and tibia, or between the bones of the forearm, uh, the radius and the ulna. Uh, very strong, held together by a very thick, wide, ligamentous type of structure. Amphiarthroses are cartilaginous joints. So one type of that is a synchondrosis, which is meant to bend, uh, like the costal cartilages of the ribs. Uh, the symphysis are very strong joints, and the symphyses are made out of fibrocartilage and as we've talked about before fibrocartilage uh, is a very fibrous type of tissue with very structured uh, layers of collagen fibers uh, and we see fibrocartilage structures or we see symphyses uh, in areas that uh, are both subject to a lot of pressure and a lot of tension, but still need some flexibility. The final type of joint that we're going to talk about is the diarthroidal joint. Diarthroidal joints are characterized by having two surfaces of hyaline cartilage that are meant to move across each other. Uh, one of the type is a gliding joint, which uh, is pretty much, as the name describes, the Joint surfaces can glide across each other in a variety of surfaces, and an example of that are the intercarpal joints of the hand. Ball socket joints are very mobile and meant to move in all directions and include uh, the examples of the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder or the hip joint. Condyloid joints uh, are meant to move mainly in one direction uh, and are characterized by an anatomical feature called a condylus. Uh, which is the Latin word for knuckle. So if there's a knuckle-shaped projection, like in the knee or the interphalangeal joints of the fingers, it's called a condyloid joint. Hinge joints are meant to move in one rotational direction. Uh, an example of that is the ulnar humeral joint of the elbow. Uh, it's a very stable joint due to its grooves and the shape of the joint and the strong ligaments that connect it. Uh, but it only moves in that one direction. A pivot joint uh, is what it sounds, it pivots around an axis. So an example of that 
would be the radial head pivoting within the annular ligament. All these joints we'll talk more specifically about uh, in kinesiology next semester. The saddle joints uh, are like two saddles facing each other. Uh, and this type of joint is a very mobile type of joint. Uh, and an example of that is the first carpal metacarpal joint where the trapezium meets the first metacarpal. They have degrees of freedom, that is how many directions they're able to move in. Uh, the most type of rotational degrees of freedom possible are three degrees of rotational freedom, uh, able to move in the sagittal, frontal, or transverse planes. Uh, other than that, the joints have a various combination of degrees of rotational or translational freedom. To describe the directions of movement, we can describe it in three translational directions and three rotational directions. The translational directions include a movement in the x-axis, which is from the left to the right for the positive direction. Uh, movement to the y-axis, is from, which is from the bottom to the top in the positive direction, and movement in the z-axis, which is from the back to the forward out toward you in the positive direction. And the opposite directions of each of those axes are considered negative movement uh, along those axes. If you take your right hand, such as shown in this picture here, and rotate it, around your index finger, uh, then your three fingers are pointing upward in the Y direction. Uh, your index finger is pointing to the right in the positive X direction, and your thumb is coming out in the positive Z direction. Rotation around those axes in the positive direction, you can also think uh, from your thumb. Uh, so if you think about your right hand, and there's a video, there we go, uh, and curling your fingers around your thumb, your thumb would be the axis, and your fingers would be the direction of positive rotation, such as we see here around the x-axis, here around the y-axis, and here around the z-axis. If you did the same thing, with your left hand, then you are describing the negative uh, direction of rotation. All freely movable or diarthrodial joints have several features, uh, including a joint capsule. And the joint capsule is made of two parts, which we'll describe in a little bit. Uh, a joint cavity. So the joint cavity is the space uh, within the joint capsule and potentially between the bones that make up the joint. Uh, the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane uh, is the inside of the joint capsule. It's very vascular and it secretes the synovial fluid. Uh, the articular or hyaline cartilage, uh, all articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage, although not all hyaline cartilage is articular. Some hyaline cartilage is structural, uh, such as that, that makes up your ears or your nose. Uh, but the hyaline cartilage that we're interested right now uh, makes up the linings of the joint surfaces. It's really important, so we'll talk about it in more detail over the next few minutes. Uh, there's nerves to the capsule, uh, and some joints also have accessory structures like labra or menisci. The capsule has two parts, the stratum fibrosum, which is collagenous and connective tissue, and the stratum synovium, which is not very strong, but is very vascular. Uh, the function of the capsule is, of course, support. Uh, some ligaments uh, in certain joints are not very strong. They're just really thickenings in the capsule. Uh, that's true of the glenohumeral ligaments, for example. Uh, for sensory feedback, remember, they have nerves, which uh, really contribute to the proprioceptive sensation, uh, and the stratum synovium uh, is what produces the synovial fluid, which bathes and nourishes the joint. 
So the synovial fluid has two parts, really. Uh, the hyaluronic acid is the viscous liquid, and the lubricin are globular proteins. We'll talk a bit more about how those function uh, within the joint uh, over the next minute or so. Uh, the job of the synovial fluid is to provide, first of all, the joint structures like the articular cartilage and possibly um, accessory structures like menisci with nutrition and oxygenation. Because remember, most of those structures are, and most of that tissue is quite distant from the bone, uh, which is its only source of circulation. So it depends upon um, the synovial fluid being soaked in when the joint is not under pressure and then squeezed out while the joint is under high pressure so that synovial fluid, which is spent of nutrition and oxygen, uh, can be replenished. Uh, and in this way, and this is a really important thing to understand, and we'll talk about it over and over again, uh, the joints really thrive on high compressive forces as long as those forces are cyclical. Again, the reason for that uh, is that they don't have much access to actual circulation. Uh, the other job, of course, is lubrication. And this is rather how it works. Again, you have the lubricin molecules, lubricin being a globular protein, which are stuck on top of the surface of the hyaline cartilage and a fluid film between uh, the surfaces so that the friction between healthy joints is very, very low. Now we're going to talk about a very important substance uh, in musculoskeletal health, which is the hyaline cartilage, which is articular. Uh, it is does not have a very high cellular component. The weight of articular cartilage is only 2% actual living cells. Uh, the extracellular matrix, uh, which includes collagen fibers and glycosaminoglycans, uh, is between 20 and 40% of the mass of hyaline cartilage and all the rest of that is water. And here we see hyaline cartilage. Uh, we can actually see that there's a defect uh, in the cartilage here. I'm going to circle it on the medial femoral condyle where that cartilage has cracked away. Collagen uh, has the function for joints of distributing the loads to decrease the amount of local pressure uh, on between the bones uh, and to minimize friction. And it does this very well when the collagen is healthy. Uh, the layers of the zones through the thickness include most superficially the tangential zone. Uh, and those are so described because of the orientation of the collagen fibers. So we're going to talk about this over the next minute or so. Uh, the middle zone uh, has collagen fibers arranged to hold the matrix together, like rebar, sort of. Uh, and the deep zone has collagen fibers that are arranged to anchor the, the cartilage uh, to the subchondral bone. So this drawing here uh, is intended to demonstrate the direction of the collagen fibers within the cartilage, within the articular cartilage, depending upon their functional zone. Uh, and these electron micrographs over on the right are showing the different zones. So if you look at the uh, micrograph uh, that we first brought up, you can clearly see the collagen fibers uh, oriented along the surface of the articular cartilage. These are the, uh, the middle zones, so collagen fibers kind of running throughout, uh, and then the deep zone collagen fibers anchoring uh, the cartilage to the bone. So I'm going to show this to you with some drawings. So the tangential zone, so-called because a tangent is a mathematical figure uh, that is going parallel uh, to a curve in a certain point. 
uh, and the tangential collagen fibers are going parallel to the surface of the cartilage. That way they help to resist uh, shear forces across the surface. The collagen fibers in the middle zone are constructed into a web. And so as a web, they are holding the, the cartilage together, holding the uh, proteoglycan gel ground substance together, uh, and they help resist the forces that might split it. Uh, then finally, the deepest zone uh, is also called the fibular zone, uh, and the collagen fibers are crossing from the subchondral bone uh, into the deepest layer of the cartilage, such as you see right here. The stratum fibrosum of the capsule has tension receptors, which are very important proprioceptors that give us information about joint angle. Uh, so they're very important in helping us to regulate accurate and efficient movement. There's also some pain sensitive areas uh, in some of the accessory structures of the joints, including the stratum fibrosum, the subchondral bone, uh, and portions of some accessory structures, but only those structures uh, which have close connection to the bone. Because remember, blood vessels and nerves don't travel freely through cartilage, either articular cartilage or fibrocartilage. They only come up from the bone, and when they are not close to the bone, there's going to be neither blood vessels nor nerves. Accessory structures include discs, uh, and one of those types of discs are the intervertebral disc. Uh, the intervertebral discs are very interesting and unique, so we're going to spend some time talking about them. You've talked about them in anatomy, and we'll talk about them quite a bit more in kinesiology as well as musculoskeletal patient management. Uh, menisci, uh, the menisci are mainly characteristic of the knee, but there's also the disc of the TMJ is also called the meniscus of the TMJ and the labra. Labra are rims of fibrocartilage uh, that we see in the shoulder and surrounding the hip. Uh, ligaments, of course, are really important uh, in holding bone to bone and fat pads are important structures for absorbing force uh, and for filling in spaces. Here we see an example of each of those structures. Here we're looking at the glenoid cossa, uh, portion of the shoulder joint that which the humeral head articulates with, uh, and I am going to outline the labrum, or the fibrocartilaginous rim that deepens the glenohumeral joint. Uh, next is the fat pad, so we're looking at a sagittal plane section of the knee, so we can see some of the menisci here, but we can also see uh, the infrapatellar fat pad. I'm outlining it with this red line, uh, and it fills in the space in between the patellar ligament, the patella itself, and the intracondylar space. Uh, and then finally, uh, here is an example of a disc. It's actually outside of shape, quite a bit different from the intervertebral discs, but it is disc shape, and so it's called. Uh, this is part of the sternoclavicular joint. We're going to introduce the idea of joint movement with a performer who has a lot of movement. We're going to talk about how we describe actual movement. So osteokinematics are the movement of the bone relative to a proximal segment. This is what we measure with the goniometer. Uh, one thing that we can't measure with the goniometer are called arthrokinematic motions. So when you see that suffix arthro, it refers to joint. Uh, and so arthrokinematic motions are the motions or the movements that the joint surfaces have relative to each other. And this is really important for understanding joint movement and also understanding manual physical therapy. So to think about arthrokinematics, 
Uh, imagine the knee flexing and extending. So the top diagram is showing a drawing of the femur uh, as it rolls forward uh, in order to extend the knee. However, if the femur, if the articular surface of the femur did not rock backward at the same time that it was rolling forward, it would roll forward right off the front edge of the knee. Uh, in addition to the rolling, it also spins. So we had talked about that a little bit uh, in anatomy, that spinning actually external rotation of the tibia, which is the same thing, and this is really important, uh, as internal rotation of the femur is called the screw home mechanism. What that does is it maximizes uh, the contact between the tibia and the femur and also tightens the collateral ligaments to make the knee a terribly stable joint when the knee is fully extended. And there are the things that we have just described. Okay, uh, now let's consider something really important, which is the convex on concave rule. I don't know if you've heard this before, uh, but it's describing the motion of bones relative to the joint centers. So in the drawing, we have a finger joint, right? Uh, and the axis of rotation, uh, I'll show you with this here, the axis of rotation uh, is within the condyles of the distal part of the phalanx. This is probably a middle phalanx. Uh, and so the rotation is always taking place around the axis of rotation. So uh, if the finger flexes uh, because of the distal, or rather the uh, middle phalanx going downward, uh, then it is rotating around the axis of rotation, uh, as you see in the joint surface here, uh, is going in the opposite, I'll draw an arrow here, is going in the opposite direction of the shaft of the bone, like this, but it's rotating around the joint surface. On the other hand, uh, if the bone that's moving is the one that has the concave surface, uh, such as the distal phalanx here, uh, then the joint surface is going in the same direction as the shaft of the bone. Again, they are both rotating around the joint surface. So if you were working with a patient, for instance, who had injured his or her finger uh, and you wanted to improve finger flexion, uh, then a good way to do that would be to grasp the proximal part of that phalanx and glide it downward, such as shown in uh, diagram B within the figure. If you were just to bend the finger, uh, such as shown in diagram C, then you would not actually be accomplishing the arthrokinematic motion, which is that glide uh, in the palmar direction of the base of the middle phalanx. You would just be uh, compressing the uh, palmar part of the base of the phalanx and distracting the connective tissue of the dorsal part. Now, just to make life a little bit harder, uh, the axis of rotation that we were just describing about in, in these con concave and convex joint surfaces, which by the way are not all joint surfaces, but for the but there are several of them, and for joint surfaces that are shaped like this, these rules apply. Uh, however, uh, an interesting thing about them is that uh, because the convex joint surfaces are not exactly round, the axis of rotation uh, does not stay in the same place within uh, that convex joint surface. So for instance, the knee is a good example. The knee uh, is actually that is, the condyles of the knee are actually oblong, so they're more flattened distally. Uh, so as the knee flexes, uh, the 
axis of rotation uh, goes backwards, and as a knee extends, the axis of rotation goes upwards, such as you see here in this diagram. And that's why the point where the axis of rotation is depends upon the joint angle, and it's also called the instantaneous axis of rotation. To help us think about joint stability, we're going to uh, ask the help of a colleague circus performer to the contortionist who is helping us with mobility, the strongman. And the strongman is going to help us think about joint stability, right? Okay, so joint stability comes from several features. Uh, passive stability comes from the shape of the joint surfaces. So, for example, uh, whereas the glenoid fossa of the shoulder is very shallow, uh, and therefore the shoulder is the glenohumeral joint is the most mobile joint in the body, uh, the acetabulum of the hip is much deeper, uh, and therefore the hip is a much more intrinsically stable joint than the shoulder is. And that's called form stability. The capsule is a connective tissue. We've talked about this before, especially the striatum fibrosum, that helps to hold the uh, joint surfaces together. Uh, ligaments are bands of connective tissue that are very structured, uh, and sometimes accessory structures like menisci or labrum. Uh, and pressure. Joints actually have a vacuum, believe it or not. Uh, and if you get the chance to actually do gross anatomy, what you may experience sometimes is sticking your scalpel into a joint capsule and hearing that vacuum suck in air for the first time in the experience of that particular joint. Uh, there's also active stability uh, that comes from joints. So the dynamic stabilizers are the muscle and the tendon, of course, because the tendon is how the muscle makes an interface with the bone uh, and the ligaments to some extent. We talked a little bit about this during anatomy, I believe, uh, that ligaments, in addition to being mechanical restraints of joints, are also sensory organs. Uh, so, for example, uh, as the ACL is stretched, it sends signals back to the nervous system, uh, telling the hamstrings to engage and in that way to help prevent too much anterior shear force across the knee. In examples that we had described previously, uh, the hip has a very deep socket in the acetabulum, so the hip really uh, depends much upon form stability. However, the shoulder, the shot, the socket, the glenoid labrum is very, very shallow, especially compared to the surface area of the humeral head. So the glenohumeral joint uh, depends much upon the active force of the rotator, rotator cuff muscles to keep it stable. The close pack position is the most stable position of a joint, although it has a couple of definitions and there's a couple of things that contribute to the close pack position. Uh, some sources describe the close pack position as the position of maximum joint congruence. Some sources depend, describe it as a position of maximum ligamentous tautness. Uh, this is really well relative to the joint. The finger joints, for example, never get all that stable. However, the knee joint, when the knee joint is in its closed pack position, it is really, really stable. Open pack is the opposite, or loose pack, uh, it's also called, is the opposite. Uh, ligaments, most ligaments are lax, and the uh, contact between joint surfaces is smaller. So over here, we have a drawing of the knee uh, in the close pack position, and this is demonstrating the knee close pack position as a position of maximum joint congruence, and therefore the position of maximum contact between the joint surfaces, in this case between the tibia and the femur, uh, and the loose pack position is with the knee flexed about 20 degrees. Uh, and there is a relatively, uh, relatively small amount of joint surface uh, in contact between the tibia and the femur. Finally, uh, gravity can really help contribute 
to the stability of joints. Uh, open chain exercise means that the distal part of the limb is free. Now, usually this describes to the lower extremity, although it can uh, apply to the upper extremity as well. So for example, uh, if we are standing and bringing our heel toward our rear end, uh, then that is an open kinetic chain exercise of the hamstring muscle. Uh, and really nothing else can do that except for the hamstring and to some extent uh, the gastrocnemius. Closed chain exercise is when the distal part of the limb is fixed on something immovable. immovable. So usually it's just the ground, uh, but it can be like a platform on a leg press as well. That's another example of a closed chain exercise. And we're, here we have a drawing of a person doing a squat. So the ground is stable, the person's feet are not moving, uh, and several muscles are contributing uh, to the movement of the legs over the planted feet. Uh, and so we have a combination of muscle tension and body weight contributing to the stability of the joints, the knee joint, uh, for example, in this case.